What's up, everybody? TJ here. Real quick before we get started with the episode, I'm testing out a new feature called Fan Mail, which is where you can actually text me from the episode that you're listening to. So as you're listening to this, go over to the episode description and right there at the beginning, you're going to see some text that says, send me a text message. Go ahead, click that. Let me know what you think about the podcast so far. Let me know of any questions, concerns, anything you might have. I love to hear from you. So go ahead, hit that up. I'm excited to read your text and let's get started with the episode. This job takes so much from you and life comes at you so fast with this job. There's people that go to slow stations, have mental health issues, are having divorces, and we're shaming those people. I'm all for tough love if it needs to get to that point, but we need to help. We need to outstretch that helping hand and not look down on these people. Let's inspire them to be better. Let's give them that flame that they used to have in their stomach when they first tried to get on this job. Let's bring that back and let's figure out why they lost it and let's build that fire. Let's build it back up. Because if we're not doing that, what are we doing for our future firefighters? Welcome to the Keep the Promise podcast, where we help build resilient and well-rounded firefighters. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Keep the Promise podcast. I'm your host, TJ, and today I am joined by... How do I even describe this dude? I mean, he is a firefighter. He is an athlete, which is going to give you a glimpse into what we're going to talk about. He has mastered the art of communicating via memes and shitposting. And generally, one of those dudes that I love chatting with and whose brains I am excited to pick. So without further ado, from fire athlete himself, Joff Fierro. Thank you, sir. Buddy, thank thank you for joining me today. How are you? Great, man. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. I know we started having thoughts about doing this a while back, and I'm glad we were able to connect and get this thing rolling. Life gets busy. You're over there. Oh, absolutely. In Phoenix. How's the weather? Um, We're actually doing pretty good right now. It's going to get hot this weekend. It's like once you once we hit about 90, I think around here, it usually does end. It just gets worse. But the weather has been absolutely gorgeous up until probably the next few days. I remember I took a trip to Phoenix a few years back and it was awesome, like 100 some degrees, dry heat. I wasn't even sweating. But then I realized how the desert was trying to kill me because I stepped out of the car and my flip flop, like my soul started melting to the pavement. I'm like, oh my God, this is insidious. <laughs> yeah. Dude, a lot of people can't, can't hang. Um, we get like, you know what snowbirds are? Mm-hmm. Snowbirds. Yeah, so we get a lot of those. Um, it's like a lot of our call support plays. They'll they'll either leave too late or they'll try and stay through the summer. Just, goodness, like, how do you guys live at 110 degrees? And I personally, people think I'm nuts. I love it. I love heat. I'm a desert rat through and through oh until I die. Like, this is my place. I hate cold. I cannot stand the cold. It's terrible. How is it? wearing turnout gear and firefighting in that heat. And I'm asking because I spent some time in Lake Havasu City. So Mm -hmm. we can go into a moral discussion about building that place. But, you know, I'd be out there pushing the limits of the car's AC to the max at noon. And I'd see guys outside training in turnout gear. I'm like, you guys are absolutely off your rockers. Like, I would run one call and just be dead for the whole rest of the shift. Yeah, it's it's different, man. Um, That being said, like, I've never worn turnout gear in negative 20 but it's cozy yeah <laughs> imagine if you keep all that heat inside right it's it's something you absolutely have to acclimate to otherwise you're not going to be able to hang it's something that i had to learn how to do quickly um but that heat dude like it's 110 degrees outside but you have all that internal heat that's stuck inside your turnouts that aren't going to breathe or mm-hmm. gonna let out any of the, the internal. Heat. And it's just, I mean, it can be your own personal nightmare for 20 to 30 minutes, or it can be like, you know what, like closing that part of my brain off. Let's just get this done because I know this is what we need to do. And then I get to take it off and it's like the best feeling in the world. Oh, that's true. I never thought about that part. Yeah. Catch that little breeze if you're lucky. And then suddenly the whole world is just amazing. Yep. It's like, it's kind of like coming out of a, uh, an ice bath almost. 
only opposite. Only right, only opposite. And uh, I, you know, I, you, the bone that I pick with you and your ice bath is that one day you're going to final destination yourself and that chest yeah. freezer close. I'll be like, hey, anybody seen Joff? Be like, no, he's like melted in his ice bath because he never secured it back. Yeah, it's, I think about that, but I also hold my hands outside the freezer like this. So at I'm least somebody's going to hear you scream when it slams shut in your fingers. Yeah. Tell me Should a little bit about your life and how you ended up in the fire department. You're Phoenix born and raised, right? Yeah, born and raised. Um, so I grew up uh, in north central Phoenix. Basically, just normal, normal life. Um, nothing too extravagant, nothing too crazy. Uh, went to Shadow Mountain High School where uh, I grew up skateboarding and i played a little bit of tennis that was pretty much it for what my a sports. dichotomy yeah i know right um very singular sports uh i mean unless you're playing doubles with tennis you're that's a that's a single sport mm -hmm. um so pretty much that dude um after high school <laughs> uh, i i was a terrible student i didn't know what i wanted to do I had a couple ideas, like I was really into photography and journalism, writing and art, and not, I, not like a normal, like I'm going to go be a doctor sort of deal. I, I don't know how to explain that, but um, failed at a community college, uh, worked a million odd jobs just trying to pay for my life outside of uh outside of school and work and whatnot you know just like trying to live be a 20 year old 21 year old and then um i met my girlfriend or my wife girlfriend at the time and her dad worked for the phoenix fire department but wasn't a firefighter he was a tech that works on like the call boxes and the tones and stuff and then if like an MCT broke, like the computers inside the truck, he would come fix those. Um, and then when I met her, uh, we got to talk in and you know, I was, do this girl really cool. I like really like this girl, blah, blah, blah. And didn't have like, like I didn't have a penny to my name, dude. I was just dumb punk kid that was not doing anything with his life. And her dad kind of caught on pretty quickly. It was like, what are you going to do? Like, when you want to marry my daughter, more or less. I don't know, dude, like, I, I'll figure it out. Um, and so we, I was a lifeguard growing up and I was good at that. I was really good at that. I liked doing that because it was outside. I got to do CPR skills and like first aid and like, you know, teach kids how to swim, and, you know, just be in the sun. And so my girlfriend, my wife, I keep calling her my girlfriend, girlfriend at the time, I was like, hey, why don't you try like EMT school if you were good at CPR and like first aid and stuff? Like, yeah, sure. Okay. And, dude, I got in there and it was taught. It was like a month long, sorry, semester long class, right? And it's taught by Phoenix guys. And it just, it clicked. I was like, oh, I like, I like learning this stuff. This is cool. Like, I'm good at this. I can retain this information. And as some, as a kid who could not apply himself to anything in school besides art, because I liked to draw and doodle and do graffiti, like that, I was like, oh, I need to hold on to this. So I, I got my EMT. Um, my grandmother passed away. The neighborhood fire department or the neighborhood fire station ran on her. I had just graduated EMT. Um, I got to see my firsthand look at what fire does outside of like fighting fires, which I had no recollection of. I didn't know. So I started talking to my girlfriend, my wife's dad. She's going to kick your ass, bro. She is. I started talking to my wife's dad and he was like, yeah, why don't you start doing ride along? And basically from there, I, it was like a stepping stone one after the other of learning how to be a part of a team learning how to be physically fit, learn how to like just embrace the suck of being in turnouts 
amongst many other things like applying yourself to being able to get a good interview so that a board will like you and think that you'll be a good teammate for 25 years. And it's just everything that I had never done in my life leading up to that was like, oh, I have to learn this like right now. And yeah, and now after five years of testing, I've been on for just over five years. So you were one of those who took him a long, long time. You were not one of those one hit wonders. No, first try Friday, as I like to call it. First try Fridays. That's a good one. Yeah. I like that movie. <laughs> It's a skateboarding term that I don't know if you're familiar with skateboarding at all. Tell me more. I used There's to rollerblade, uh, AKA fall. There. There's a park, um, a famous park called the barracks in California where they would shoot, like they had their own website and they would just shoot a lot of videos that would, they would put on YouTube. Like, crazy, crazy skate clips of, you know, prof professional skaters doing stuff. And, um, One of them was first try Fridays. And if you could like land this certain trick, it was on Friday, you got like a prize. So I like how I that applies to the fire try. service though. So. Yeah. It's um some some a few people have gotten lucky with that first try Fridays, but I think most of us have had to spend quite a bit of time getting I think I had I think it was a spend of like two or three years applying to different departments. And I know that there were others, you know, you hear the stories of the guys who spent six, seven, and they just never, yeah. ever, ever gave up. Yeah. I, uh, I applied everywhere. My second choice was Chandler fire department because I worked with oh, them been there. for four and a half years on, on their ambulances out there through AMR. But I was like a civilian EMT that was contracted to their specific fire rescues. But my heart was in Phoenix, dude. I knew where I wanted to be. Chandler would have been an incredible part department to work for if I was smart enough to pass their test. But I, I applied everywhere. So five years on, did I, I assume you guys have to go through a fire academy or is it like some of the other places that you do your training first and then you get hired? Uh, yeah, they, they host their own fire academy. How was that? It is uh, three, three months, about anywhere from like 14 to 16 weeks, depending on the time of year. And incredible experience all around. I did a firefighter one and two. Okay. Um, just to make myself, well, that, there was two reasons to understand the fire service more because my mentor at the time that I was writing along with was like, I remember this, this, the specific day we were, we went to this Wells Fargo building downtown and we were talking about FDCs and I'm just standing there, brand new writer like just stoked to be there because I'm like standing with a bunch of firefighters I'm like oh my gosh this is so cool and uh the captain who was my mentor was like hey do you have to what we're talking about no but like we're gonna go climb stairs and like do cool stuff right he's like yeah uh, you should go through a firefighter one and two program like all right sounds good and I I think I signed up like a week and dude like kicked my ass absolutely kicked my ass and it's it's three days a week you know what i mean like it's not even an actual academy but it, it like 100 put me in the right mindset of like where i was supposed to be so that's why i was like oh, okay i need to like i need to be a lot better at this did you finally learn about fdcs yeah yeah I finally learned about those was able to reiterate that or regurgitate that information when i started going logs Where are you stationed these days? Tell me, tell me more about your station life. I'm a, uh, a B shift rover. Oh God. B shift. Jesus. I'm going to end this interview right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. <laughs> B shift stands for best ship. Just so. Yeah. Whatever. Knows. More like buttholes. Um, I, so I started off on a shift kind of a, kind of an odd turn of events. So raised by the C shifters, right? That was who I was riding along. So you're feral. And I got into the, what's that? So you're basically feral if you were raised <laughs> by the sea shifters. A jack of all trades, I guess. Or just, I just, I don't know, wanted to get to know everybody. Because why not? Uh, <laughs> uh, ra yeah, raised by the sea shifters, helped out by them to get hired. I had a lot of 
a few friends, very close friends on B shift. And then when I got into the academy, all of my, my homies were A shift or were going to go A shift. I remember specifically, I was like, well, I don't really know any A shifters. And like, I know that like, that's absolutely going to be way outside of my comfort zone. So I'm going to go A shift. And I got a spot on A shift and what did my booter year, my probationary year on A shift and then roved for about a year until I took a spot on rescue 17 as a B shifter. And now I'm on B shift and I've seen the light. <laughs> no, no hate to my A shift brothers and sisters, but B shift is good life. And maybe someday I'll, I'll see myself on C shift, but we'll see what happens. God, you just keep going from bad to worse. Yeah, we talked yeah. about you roving, and that is such a weird concept for me because we call them floats, and we have float yeah. officers. But that's about it. The only time that in my entire career that we've had any sort of floating firefighters was when we were opening a new station. There were some delays, but everybody had already been assigned. So they basically said, hey, the shift that you're going to work at this new station you're just going to float to wherever we need you. So drive a fire engine or go ride an ambulance, whatever, until the station opens. So the concept of your assignment being just float is, um, it's truly unique. It's something different. It's, it's really interesting, dude, because we have so many firefighters that like they have to account for people being off, people being sick, vacation time. Uh, we call them local 493 days, which is our quarterly day off. Okay. Like they have to account for all of that. Like amongst like the sick pile, the injured pile, we have a, I think our roving pool consists of like, I think it's two to 300 people. Oh my. Which is almost a full shift in itself. Yeah. It's, it's big dude, because we have like, I think it's close to 2000 members. And I think 1500 of those are active. I could be completely wrong, but I know we have close to 2000. Um, so I call up every morning of, of my shift at 6 a.m. and say, it's called South Deputy and they decide where everybody goes that day. And it's I'm like, Hey, Skip, how's it going? Jonathan Fierro, like, well, uh, go to uh, ladder 20 and drive. Yes, sir. That's where I'm at for the day. Dude, that's wild. Not even like telestaff the shift before. No, nothing. You figure it out that morning. Yeah. Yeah. So you can get on telestaff in the morning and see if they've updated, like, but because they're so busy trying to figure out like this, this spot needs ALS guys. And this guy, this spot over here needs an engineer, but the front seats ALS and the back seats BLS. And we have to, it's just like, I don't understand how they do it. It's, it's nuts. I'm glad so you, we're not the only ones with those goofy rules because we try to make Telesef automate the whole thing. And the developers were like, uh, no, there's, you're going to break the computer. Like you're going to break the AI. And so. There's apparently I've heard before, like there is like a button that they can just press and it puts everybody in their spots where they would need people. But because we're such a dynamic department and we have so many people and unfortunately we have, you know, head butting from time to time. Uh, there's places where like certain people can't go. And we we're, you know, we take care of our like that's what we have to do and. So it's like, hey, I there's stations that I enjoy going to. You know what I mean? And there's stations where I'm like, nah. I could I could do without going back there. Um, but like I kind of attest that to the right word. Uh a tribute. I, I like to say like I'll work with anybody, yeah. right? Be the guy that shows up, does his job, goes home. And it has a smile on his face and a good attitude. And, or I'm sorry, the, the guy or a girl. Good save. Good save. Either one. Almost had me canceled there. So five years on, and uh, what... Tell me a little bit about Fire Athlete, and we'll go into the life cycle of that. We'll go into what led you to start it and your goals, dreams, aspirations for that. But at what point did you decide, hey, I want to do something more? So I was doing work with trying to figure out how I should start this. I was doing work with another company um, that 
basically was like, hey, we're going to start a firefighter fitness page. And I laughed and was like, good luck. Because the market is so saturated with those right now that like there's absolutely no way that that's going to be a thing. We talked about it and um, we got some more people involved. And basically they were like, hey, we need a face and we need a coat. And so I met Adrian Hernandez, who is a fire athletes head coach, um, who works for Gila River Fire Department as their, he's been a captain for quite a while and has like, it's like fit, I think it's 18 years in the fitness industry, just coaching and programming and being a jack of all trades. Like he, he runs their, their academies or did, uh, he stepped out of that field as of recently, but, um, just wealth of knowledge. So I start in his brain. He starts picking mine because I have the social media and he has the brains behind the, the fitness. And he's like, I want you to go get these certifications to make us feel a little bit more legitimized. And I'm going to start typing up some programs. And so we started with three base programs. It was uh, push the line, which is our, um, our get fit, stay fit program. We had Old Salt, which is an injured wanting to come back to the truck program, which is a little bit slower, but kind of the same and moderate, same intensity. And then we had our Wildland program. So we started with those. We started, we were like, let's build a little bit of a team. Let's do this. Let's do that. Had a couple ideas that didn't work out. And basically, we kind of just, we just kind of went, you know what I mean? Like we got, a, we got a website created, we got the Instagram created, and then we got the workout programs and just started trying to plug and play like, Hey, we've got these programs that are going to help you with the fire service, help you get into the fire service, help you stay fit. If you're trying to be a wildland firefighter, let's do that. And it kind of just flourished into what it is on top of like, like consistent everyday posting with social media and content creation. Like we also throw in like goofy videos to try and be more well-rounded as opposed to like, that. just like we're hard hitters. Like we carry the boats every day. We, who's going to carry the logs? Like, don't get me wrong. If that wakes you up in the morning, I love that. That's, that's not us. And that's not the kind of vibe that I'm trying to portray. Plus it's not real life. You and you're I mean? landlocked in Arizona. No boats. Yeah, there's no boats. No, I get that. You have to have that, um, I don't want to say variety because that makes it seem kind of wishy-washy, but it's that balance because there is such a yeah. thing as completely saturating yourself with the like Jocko Huberman, like everything rah, 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 like amazing, amazing, amazing. Like at some point, just be human. And we're all firefighters, so we're all jacked up in the head anyway and we all enjoy really crass and childish humor might as well speak to that as well because that that's what makes us relatable absolutely like don't get me wrong man like what jocko and huberman do and what's his name the guy who cares uh goggins goggins thank you sorry sorry david goggins um he's gonna run over there and whoop your do ass is inspire millions of people. Hey guys, while we're on a quick break, I want to share something special with you. It's a podcast that resonates deeply with what we often discuss here about resilience and mental health. This podcast is called The Things We All Carry. Imagine that you're finishing up a tough call, the smoke is clearing, you're packing up your gear, but sometimes what you carry out of that call isn't just physical. It's the weight of the experience and the echoes of the things that you've seen and done. The Things We All Carry dives into these moments. Hosted by my good friend Stack, this podcast is about unpacking the emotional baggage that we all take home after the call ends. It's about transforming our shared traumas into shared healing. In every episode, you're going to hear real stories from fellow firefighters who have been where you are, who understand the burden and the honor of our profession. And they share not just their challenges, but also the steps that they've taken towards recovering from those challenges. Proving that while our trauma may be unique, our paths to healing are all connected. 
So after we finish up here, take a moment and visit the things we all carry on your favorite podcast platforms. Hit subscribe and join that community that understands the weight of what we carry and the strength that we gain from sharing our stories. Remember, you're not alone out there. We're here to carry the load together. But like, I, I remember when we when we were trying to start this, they were like, we need to be like, we need to be that that hard go getter attitude. It's like, that's not real life. Like, that's not fun. Like people get, I don't know if you blatantly scroll through Instagram like I do to get content ideas. Don't tell everyone my secrets. Just get my nightly routine, unfortunately. Um, like if somebody posts the same umbrella idea every single day, like it's just another inspirational quote one after the other like i unfollow that page because it's mundane and there's no there's no like creativity to it there's there's nothing behind that and don't get me wrong i'm not like like hating on pages that like only do that but like give me something else give me personality give me creativity give me a different mindset of something else besides Fitness is the only way. And if you don't have fitness, you might as well just go jump off a bridge. <laughs> like, dude. So when we started this, I like, I was absolutely like, we are not doing that. We are not shaming people for not wanting to be the top tier fitness they can be. We're not fat shaming. We're not sh- hate shaming firefighters that like, dude, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. And I know I'm getting off on a tangent here. Go for it. I love it. Like we, we on our own a lot sometimes. And that like, that hurts. That hurts me because this job takes so much from you and life comes at you so fast with this job. And like, and to 20 to 30 pounds, especially with the way most of us eat is like, your your level of fitness is going to decline quickly if you let it. And that's kind of the problem, right? Like you should we shouldn't be able to be in that area where we're allowing that to happen because we have a job to do. But at the same time, like there's people that go to slow stations, have mental health issues, are having divorces, are like their children are growing up and like there's no time. And we're, we're like, we're shaming those people for living lives and doing like what they said they were going to do in their interview in the first place. Like, I'm going to be a good team. I'm all for tough love if it, if it needs to get to that point. But like, there's also a level of like, we need to, we need to help. We need to outstretch that helping hand and not like look down on these people. Like, oh, you're just lazy. Shit. Maybe they are lazy, but hey, let's inspire them to be better. Let's give them that flame that they used to have in their in their stomach when they first tried to get on this job. Let's bring that back and let's figure out why they lost it. And let's build that fire. Let's build it back up. Because if we're not doing that, what are we what are we doing for our future firefighters? Like. I don't know. I love that analogy. I love the analogy of, of rekindling that fire because spend long enough in the fire department and yours is going to dwindle. Yours is going to, it might go out and you might find somebody who will help you light that candle. I mean, there's a picture of a fire that we had Christmas day. Jesus Christ. Like six months after I left the academy. And buddy, I had enough chins to have their own zip code. Six months after being in the best shape of my life, like I took the picture, I'm like, holy shit, I am going to find that bridge and jump out of it. A year ago, same thing. I was I was in Amsterdam and there's a picture that I saw that I'm like, mother of God, the buttons on that shirt are about to go completely supersonic and take somebody's eyeball out. So what I want to pick your brain about is you've done this for a while. And we know how frustrating it is because we can come to our brothers and sisters and say, hey, here's a plan. Here's the way that 
your body will do better with this kind of food, with this kind of exercise, with this kind of routine. And we know that we're also stubborn. And we know that for somebody to tell us how to fix things, sometimes we don't, we're not very receptive. How? How to say, say that I have a shift mate who was in good shape. Life happened, right? Stress eating. I'm guilty of that. And now they are not in the best fighting shape they could be, but they're also not receptive. Taking your experience, taking what you've done, what's the best way to go? And I'm saying this because I guarantee you people listening right now are going like, oh shit, I know somebody like that or like, oh shit, that's me. Yeah. Yeah. There's my, so my, my biggest thing is all you can do is ask, right? Like when I would go into the gym, when I was at a state at station 17 for a while, I'd always ask and be like, Hey, anybody want to work out with me today? And I had Matt Delagarda, who's one of my best friends on the job, who's also a part of fire athlete, Who big, is strong, jacked. right? Big dude. And he and I, most of the time, unless it was like a rest day or something, we would do stupid workouts together. And every day I would ask everybody else on that job or on that truck, unless like we were doing a skills course, which was usually a team building activity, which everybody joined in on most of the time, unless you're, you know, if you're feeling down and out that day or dude, I'm sore, I'm tired, my back hurts, like blah, blah, blah. We were doing those together. But Outside of that, like lifting and like the cardiovascular workouts that we were doing, I would just ask. And every once in a while, they would jump in. You know what I mean? And like they, it's, you kind of see that, like it, it clicks. Like you're going to get people who are going to be like, no, I don't want to do that. Like I'm going to go off in a couple different angles here. One of the reasons I love CrossFit. So much. And because our, our functional fitness, however you want to call it, CrossFit is for everybody, right? Fitness has no discrimination. Your level of fitness has a level of discrimination, but fitness is non-discriminatory in itself. It's for everybody. So if I am doing power cleans and somebody goes, Hey, I want to do this workout, but I can't do that movement. That's crazy. I'm going to go, we'll take these two 20 pound kettlebells or these two 20 pound dumbbells. And I want you to go into this position and you're going to use your body mechanics to get those up to your shoulders because you can't do this yet with this amount of weight, but I'm going to teach you how to get there so that you can get to this spot where you want. And it's, it's like that, that idea of giving that to people, right? Like I'm going to show you consistently every day that like, if I'm doing this, you can be doing this. And yes, there's, there's like, people are like, oh, no excuses, no excuses. Dude, there's so many excuses. There's, there's so many. Some, some not so good. Some pretty valid excuses every once in a while. Like, hey, man, my head's not in the right place today. I don't even want to be at the station. Like, I am not in the mental space to be working out today. And brother, that's okay. Like, that's, that's fine. We'll be here next shift too. We've got next shift and the one after that and the one after that for 25 fucking years, dude. And any help that you need along the way, I'm going to be here for. So I'm going to ask every single shift. Hey, does anybody want to work out today? Um, one of the bigger things when I first started anything fitness in my, in my genre, because like I said, skateboarding and tennis were my, my wheelhouse. So team-based activities were not a thing for me. And I had to learn how to work in a skills course-based activity or in an engine company-based activity. You know what I mean? So when I first started riding along and we would do skills courses, I would do my skills course before, like, I would take a little bit longer, I'd be a little bit quicker, and I'd take my stuff off. And I'd go sit in the bay. And this is a, a dude who didn't know the culture, who didn't know like the stigmas, didn't know, you know, what you're supposed to be doing. And I'd have mentors come over or backseat firefighters and hey man, the captain's still working or the officer, the skip, you should still have your stuff off and still be working. Because think of this as you're on the fire ground. 
if your captain's working, your ass better still be in gear, helping him or making his load lighter. Because he's been doing this for 15 years, dude. You have two years on. Get to fucking work. And I would be like, oh, okay. So I, you know, slowly but surely that starts clicking. You start working harder. You start pushing harder. You start gaining more experience. And suddenly you've dragged a tire before, right? Mm -hmm. I would hope so. Everybody says that that's the hardest thing to do in a skills course, which it is. Most of the time, I think pulling ceiling is the hardest thing to do in a skills course because we don't do it as often. Uh, but the more you do it, the easier it gets, right? It still sucks, but it gets easier. You just have to do it consistently. And that's anything with fitness. You have to do it consistently. And when it starts getting easier is when you start pushing it more. When you start adding more weight, when you start running more miles, when you start doing more things to make you better every single day. Mic drop, huh? That's it. That's all. I One of the things that attracted me to Fire Athlete from the get-go is, and you touched about it earlier, is that I called it inclusivity in the questions that I sent you. And it's it really ties in to the mindset that I've been trying to cultivate myself and with people I know, and that is stop eating our young. Let's stop shitting on each other for being different. Let's stop... like. There's a lot of the fire service culture that I cannot wait for some of these boomers to retire, for us to completely eradicate that culture, including eating our young and treating them like absolute shit and fat shaming and skill shaming and doing all of these things. I remember one of the guys that I went through the academy with, he, I mean, I think he, he went to a good house, but the guy started fucking with him from the get go, like taking a glass of water and just dumping it on the floor for him to clean. Number one, I would have come back with a machete and just completely butchered everyone if they had done that to me. Uh, is, is that an admission of guilt? I don't know. Is that like... I think that's a myth. Well, just... What's that Tom Cruise movie with the like the, the two chicks who are in that in that pool that like they can tell when the crimes uh -oh. are going to happen? Minority Total Report? Recall. Total Recall. One of those two. No, no, you're... Yeah, you were right. Minority Report? Minority Report. Anyway, yeah, I don't think they can get me for that one. Point being... I told one of my mentors, who's a DC firefighter, that story, and he goes, that's cool. They can keep doing all that stuff. But the guy who's dumping that glass of water, he falls through a floor in a fire a couple hours down the road. All that his rookie's going to be seeing with hatred in his eyes while that dude is screaming for help is, oh, this motherfucker just fuck with me for so many hours. Granted, we are yeah. obviously going to save our own all the time. But it's just that mindset of like, you are new, you don't have the experience I do, therefore you're a servant. I absolutely hate it. I, I, you are here to take over from me when I am gone. You are here to, you know, pat, to get the torch passed on to you and to continue doing this job. You are not here to be my maid. You are not here to be my punching bag. You are not here to be the butt of all my jokes. Like you are part of the team. You're just a less tenured member and we'll get you there. And then hopefully you're going to pass on those same skills and knowledge and, and mindset to those who come after you. So that's one of the things that I like about Fire Athlete is that you, I don't know, you keep it real. You guys, you guys are, are inclusive. We're being so woke. You are inclusive <laughs> of, of everybody. And, um, and especially that that population of firefighters who really need it, who who are right at that that peak of like, hey, I'm either going to get myself in shape or I'm going to fall right back down into old habits. Yeah, I and thank you, I appreciate that. I haven't i I've, I've heard I've heard rumors like we luckily like my department I got out of that a while ago, well before I was on. Um, and I've, I've heard inklings stories, and, but w one of the things that I, like, I pride myself on with our department is that we, yes, we pick and prod at each other sometimes more often than not, but we're good with our probationary firefighters, uh, the ones that care. And there are a lot of them that care. No, there's. There's like, it's every department, right? There's, there's always the guy that 
doesn't want to train, that doesn't want to work out, that train the, the new guy. But everywhere that I have been roving around on the shifts that I rove around on, they, they care. And it's great. It's like, hey, what are we doing today is most of the time, like the first question that's asked on the truck. It's like, well, we're going to check off our truck. We're going to make sure everything's working. We're going to bathrooms. We're going to clean. Bay. We're going to do a once over on the, on the station. And then let's go train. Let's go shop for food. And then let's work out after that. And then let's cook. Let's build camaraderie. Let's watch a movie. If time allows, because we're running so many freaking calls. <laughs> And so on and so forth. And a structured, well-planned day is, you know, key, you know, because you have your, you have your routine. And a lot of younger firefighters that I've seen come on the job as of recent because of the shortage that we have in firefighters didn't do right alongs. They were just like, I want to be a firefighter. So I'm going to go take the test, learn how to interview the way that they want me to. And get hired. And I've noticed, like, as a few other people have that I've talked to, that there is a, a decent, significant amount, I'm sorry, a decent amount of newer firefighters that don't understand the culture yet. So they're getting, they're, they're getting criticized for not being the stereotypical booter, probationary firefighter, when they didn't know in the first place that this is what you're supposed to be doing. There's there's that whole mantra, booters are seen, not heard sort of deal. And I hate that. Like, I get it. There's a time and a place for probationary firefighters to talk and, you know, share their feelings about things or ask questions. But like to just think that this person just is here to clean and train and cook for me and clean for me is just such an asinine thought process. Like that's a human. That's somebody that, like you said, you want to pull you through a floorboard if for some reason something goes wrong and they're like, you know what? I really don't like this guy. And that's never going to happen. But like, if I had a backseat guy that treated me like crap, ah, dude, that was, it would be, it would make life, it would make this job so much more less appealing. You know what I mean? Like, why would you want to come to to work where people just pick on you all day? Hey everyone, it's TJ here from Keep the Promise. As you know, this podcast is all about helping firefighters become more resilient and well-rounded so that they can be a force for good within their fire department and their community. But today, I want to talk to you about something that's just as important, and that is supporting firefighters who are going through tough times. When one of our fellow firefighters is off work because they have to go to the Center for Excellence, they have to go to rehab, they have mental health issues, or they have other health issues, it really takes away their support system and it wreaks havoc on their finances and their family's finances. And many times, these brothers and sisters are left to struggle alone away from their support system and the people who love them without the resources they need to recover. That's why I'm setting a bold new goal. And that is to reach 150 total patrons on Patreon so that we can start a fund to help firefighters and their families during these challenging times. And I need your help to make it happen. With your support on Patreon, we'll be able to provide financial assistance to firefighter families who are battling things like addiction, depression, and cancer. We're going to help alleviate the financial strain that can come with being away from the fire department so that our brothers and sisters can focus on healing and recovering. Now, reaching 150 total patrons is a big goal, but I believe that we can do it together. And when we do, we'll be able to make a real difference in the lives of those who serve and protect alongside us. So if you're not already a patron, I invite you to join us today. Head over to joinkeepthepromise.com and sign up today. Again, that is joinkeepthepromise.com. And if you already are a patron, thank you so much for your support. You'll be receiving some exclusive rewards and perks as a way of saying thanks. Together, let's show our fellow firefighters that we've got their back just like they always have ours. 
Thank you for listening. Let's get started with the episode.